Welcome to the future. Science, technology, innovation, all the latest developments from around Russia. We've got the future covered. Ten days in the mystery country, among people who are not used to the presence of journalists, in areas never before filmed by cameras, seeing the life that international press headlines never consider. RT introduces you to life in North Korea. I was raped in December 2010. You're more likely to be raped in college than in the real world. I didn't think people did that to each other when they knew each other. I thought rape was a stranger in the bushes. Girl complaining about the son of an alumni who gives millions of dollars to the school. Why listen to somebody who's going to lose money for the school? Schools that make money-based decisions are much more common than they would ever admit publicly. Weapons. It's a political issue in this country, and any time that somebody raises the issue of gun control, they immediately get attacked by special interest groups. Skirmishes. They consider a person 25 or 30 as an old person. They don't see themselves living beyond that. These young people think that they will not live past 25 or 30 years old. Victims. Once he opened the door, somebody started shooting. His brother didn't get shot, he got shot. He don't know what could have happened. Terror. You don't know who could be walking behind you or by you. And you can walk into the wrong crowd and they will jump on you. Civil War. Chicago. Dealing with gangs. Pumps use guns! Stop the shooting! 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 Stop the violence! It's 7 p.m. right now here in Moscow. The headlines today, Moscow and Beijing sign a new framework gas supply agreement that will see China surpass Europe as Russia's biggest consumer when it's implemented. And it being the weekly here on a Sunday, the big uh, stories that made the news in the week, among them anti-government anger, violent clashes erupted in Belgium as 100,000 protested against drastic austerity measures. Story happening right now, we're going to bring up speed as well. Germany marks 25 years since the Berlin Wall fell. The Soviet leader who helped end the Cold War blames Washington for a new era of global confrontation. And another live event as well, Catalonia voting today says it won't cave in. The defiant Spanish region cast a symbolic vote on splitting from Madrid after an official referendum was banned. We've got the latest on that. If you just join us for a good evening from me, Kevin Owen, you're with RT International. As I say, a busy news hour to talk about then. And we'll start, first of all, in Beijing, where the leaders of Russia and China in the last few hours struck a framework deal to supply gas uh, through what's known as the Western Route. The agreement could make China the biggest consumer of Russian gas when it all gets completed. It also comes just months after another major gas supply deal uh, was signed off on. Paul Scott talks about it all. Now, you may remember earlier this year, the two countries signed the biggest gas deal in history, 400 billion US dollars for Russia to supply gas to China for up to 30 years. Well, the announcement of this uh, second pipeline, this second route, which is going to be known as Western Route, is expected to almost double uh, the volume of gas that can be exported between the two countries. Just to give you an idea of how uh, large this deal is, it means that China will become the sole importer of Russian gas. In 2013, trade between the two countries 
uh, almost hit the 90 billion US dollar mark and that is expected uh, to increase in 2014 as well. And the two countries are also prominent members of the uh, what's known as the BRICS nations, the five emerging economies, Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa, who are amongst them in July this year announced the formation of the so-called BRICS bank, 100 billion US dollars. Now that's seen as a rival, an alternative to the International Monetary Fund and an attempt to try and stop the global dominance of the US dollar. So as relations between uh, Russia and the West uh, deteriorate and as tensions continue there, uh, it looks as if uh, ties between Russia and the East are going from strength to strength, certainly here at APEC 2014. Paul Scott there. Well, this major framework agreement could see uh, China become Russia's biggest customer, as I was saying, far surpassing the European Union. It's thought gas supplies through this uh, so-called Western Altai pipeline, this route, could reach up to 30 billion cubic metres a year. A lot of gas. Beijing-based journalist Lin Xiaoen spoke to me. He says the deal comes at a crucial moment for both countries, too. It's really a sh shot in the arm for both economies, Russia and China. When China is looking for uh, more sources of energy, uh, Russia is looking for a stable long-term market and that's reliable. And we, be we be both reach uh, a deal that will last for decades. When China is hosting the current APEC leadership uh, summit in Beijing, we're talking about uh, interconnectivity and we are talking about uh, a pan-Pacific ring uh, free trade area where both countries can benefit a lot and contribute a lot to such kind of interconnectivity. Interestingly, too, uh, President Obama's heading to Beijing as well, uh, hot on the heels of this deal being signed. What's he going to make of this um, new framework agreement signed between uh, Russia and China? I guess he's not very happy about this because uh, uh, the U.S. led sanctions over Russia. Uh, they want to see uh, concrete results as it proceeds in their direction. But at the same time, uh, China and Russia are saying that uh, we can cooperate. We're partners. And uh, regardless of whatever you disagree with each other, we're not going to uh, influence by your uh, mindsets of what things could, how things should, should go. We're tracking this big story online, yet more details of this uh, major economic agreement. You can read more about it at RT.com, along with all the developments coming out of the Apex Summit in Beijing too. So celebrations there. Celebrations too for Germany today. Uh, Sunday marks 25 years since the Berlin Wall fell. The notorious fortified barrier between East and West has been recreated too for the anniversary, with thousands of illuminated balloons instead of concrete. just how big it is from space there. A 15-kilometre line has retraced the route which divided the German capital for decades. That installation serves as a reminder of both the joy and of the tearing of the wall down and, of course, the memory, too, of those who died trying to cross it. Artis Peter Oliver is there amidst the uh, celebrations in Berlin. Hi there. Pretty big night for Berlin. What's planned there? Well, as you can probably hear behind me, the celebrations are well underway. I'm here at the Brandenburg Gate where a rock concert is taking place. Um, lots of different bands from Germany before the wall and Germany after the wall as well. Uh, we're going to see take to the stage. But what we are all waiting to see is those balloons that we just saw. They are truly spectacular. It's hard to put into words just how, how beautiful, how poignant they are for what they symbolize, tracing that line along the wall. They will, at them um, in about an hour's time or so, they'll be released into the sky. I'm sorry if you can't hear me over the noise of the band. Um, they'll be soaring up into the sky to the strains of Beethoven's Ode to Joy, and, the, and then um, they were released by, I say, thousands, those 8,000 balloons released up into the sky. A little bit away from where I am right now, there's a, I'm sure, no less celebratory, but I'm sure far more quieter concert taking place. Attending that is German Chancellor Angela Merkel. She's met up with former Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev at that event. Um, now, Mikhail Gorbachev was speaking on Saturday at the symposium that he organises against a new Cold War. Now, 
He said that at the moment the world stood on the brink of a potential new Cold War. He was warning against that and he placed the blame for that um, really firmly at the door of the West and in particularly at the door of the United States. I think what's happened in the past few months has been a collapse of the trust which had been created through hard work and mutual effort in the process of ending the Cold War. This trust wasn't undermined only yesterday. Euphoria and triumphalism hit the heads of Western leaders. Taking advantage of Russia's weakness and a lack of a counterweight, they claimed a monopoly on leadership and domination in the world. I'll name just a few examples. The expansion of NATO, Yugoslavia, Kosovo, missile defense plans, Iraq, Libya and Syria. Well, when the wall came down, Mr Gorbachev had said that those divisions that existed within Europe were supposed to disappear. But as my colleague Murad Gazdiev reports, they never really did. 25 years ago, the world changed. The Berlin Wall, a symbol of the Cold War, was torn down with the Soviet Union's blessing. It was to be a new era. This is one of the sections of the Berlin Wall brought here to the Imperial War Museum. After all, its destruction was one of the highlights of the 20th century. It was hoped that with the wall gone, the deep divisions between the East and the West, between the Warsaw Pact and NATO, would finally be allowed to heal and that the world could be more united than ever before. And for a time, the euphoria was not misplaced. The great armies were stood down, the USSR dissolved, and the ideological war was ended. But NATO stayed on, hatching its new plans. NATO has the role of promoting change. It's a political alliance. It's a platform where you can harmonize, coordinate Western policy. Our opportunity clearly is to bring the world closer to our vision. A vision that seemingly required serious firepower, and a lot of it. With the Warsaw Pact gone and nothing left to keep NATO at bay, it expanded. This is a global, aggressive, expeditionary military formation, one which is having daily, daily war games on Russia's borders in countries like Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, Poland, uh, Norway, and dangerously close to Russian territory in nations like Bulgaria, Romania, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and so forth. This is a threat to world peace. It is the greatest threat ever to world peace. The current rift with Moscow has sent Western politicians positively buzzing with catchphrases from the past. We will reinforce our NATO allies and uphold our commitment to collective self-defense. Russia needs to know that action will follow uh, if there isn't a radical change in the way they behave. We are conducting over 200 NATO and national exercises in Europe. These assurance measures are just the start. 25 years since the collapse of the old wall, new ones are going up. For now, they're economic and political, but ones that serve as an eerie reminder of a time when all that people wanted was a little unity. Morad Gazdiev, RT. European governments are hard-pressed to balance their foreign policy priorities amid the new confrontation between Moscow and Washington. That's the view of publicist and author Victor Grossman, who spoke to me. Especially Germany, with Merkel, uh, Angela Merkel, are torn between those who want to move forward, who want to expand, and there are many forces in Germany, basically the same old forces that were there for the First World War and for the Second World War, who helped build fascism. They want to expand through all the world, Eastern Europe, and if possible, Asia and Africa and every place. They're working hard on Merkel, and so is the Washington, uh, the forces that be in Washington who, who want to expand, but she's also impressed by people who are against that. And this means partly people demonstrating against any war. There haven't been any very big demonstrations as yet. There have been uh, smaller ones around the country. I hope that they will increase now uh, as people begin to see the dangers involved in, in, in any, any possible fireworks. 
Well, delving back into the history books, the history of it is that war was set up by East German authorities in 1961, then to try and stop the exodus of civilians to West Berlin. But people nonetheless kept attempting to cross that infamous barrier. 136 of them didn't live to tell the tale. Refugees, though, tried to be creative, to use any method they could think of to try to get across that barrier, past the concrete blocks, the barbed wire, the guards, the dogs. This guy here did it. His name's Peter Faust. He decided to take the long way around as well. Back in 1988, this is his story, he sailed from east to west Germany through the Baltic Sea in a kayak. Uh, he made himself uh, to reunite himself with his wife. It's a real love story. We went to his house to hear more about the daring escape. I had prepared five different scenarios of how to escape. I was thinking of going across the border with a fake visa, and I also made a head cover that looked like a bird and considered swimming across the lake. For six months I prepared for this escape, and I worked on all those plans simultaneously. The Baltic Sea seemed to be the least dangerous route, so I studied a book on how to sail alone on the open sea. Then I got an inflatable kayak and made my own sail, which I controlled with a hockey stick, that way I could practically windsurf while sitting. So then, this is the route Peter took. He managed to evade the border guards. That was his big worry while he inflated his kayak on the beach. He did it under the cover of darkness, the cover of night. He braved the storms and large waves of the open sea. Then a bit of luck, more luck, halfway through across the Baltic, he was picked up by a passenger ferry that took him onto West Germany. My wife had no idea about my plans. I could not tell her by telephone as all conversations between East and West were monitored. But I told her over the phone that if you don't hear from me for a while, that means I'm in a psychiatric hospital. So when I finally came to shore and was able to make a phone call to my wife, I said, hello, I'm in the West. And of course, she thought I was calling from the psychiatric hospital. Only after the second call, she finally understood that we were able to be together again. Brave guy. Well, unlike Peter, some Germans decided to tackle the wall head on, or rather under it and over it. In 1962, a group of citizens led them by an 81-year-old tunneled so much they actually dug a, bar uh, dug a tunnel right under that barrier. A year later, an acrobat uh, went on a tightrope, some sort of a wire that was over there, right above the heads of the guards. He managed to do it slowly, hand over hand. Also, uh, in 1979, two families created a balloon out of bed sheets. They literally sailed their way over the top and into West Germany. I hope you stay with us. More stories to come. We've got live coverage of Sunday's commemorations in Berlin and more of this big story. Ahead as well, other stories we're covering this hour. Internet freedom campaign is all over the world. Remember, hacktivist and programmer Aaron Swartz. He was on this channel a lot. The supporter he was of an open and free internet, driven to suicide by a standoff with the state almost two years ago. We remember him.